Well, this game's an oddity. I feel like I'll probably be way kinder than people expect to this game, despite my harshness on Fire Red and Leaf Green, even though I think this game is... very... weird. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, I guess that's the announciation from the exclamation points, are currently the newest in Game Freak's long lineage of forcing us to go through Kanto again. Released just a few years ago in 2018 and the first semi-mainline Pokemon games on the Switch. Mainline is a bit of a contentious point, as they definitely have some deviations from the proper mainline games. The two games serve to remake Pokemon Yellow. Yeah, two from one, and roughly follow that game's progression, plot, and gimmicky conceit that is a non-traditional starter. And while mostly following the traditional route and story of the Kanto games, breaks the story in really strange ways as a result of being a weird isekai, where red and blue are NPCs in the world outside of what the player does. It I'll come back to it. Before I get lost in that particular rabbit hole, let's talk about gameplay real quick. There's a lot on the table here, primarily in that a large chunk of the series' core gameplay has been ham-fistedly stripped from these games. Trainer battles mostly play out the same as before. This is the first can of game to have a physical special split, but even this has some weird conceits. Held items and abilities are stripped out in favor of simplifying this game as much as possible to try to bring in nostalgic boomers and genuine toddlers. This whole game aim is very young, very obviously, and that shows the most with the Pokemon Go inspired wild encounters. No battling, no balancing enemy HP and status, just throwing balls at shrinking rings. There's a touch of nuance, there are various berries that can be fed to wild Pokemon to increase catch rate, increase the odds of item drops, or make a Pokemon stop moving, but it's largely the one repetitive action over and over. The whole game focuses on this aspect. This is how you get a majority of your experience after all, but also the candies that Pokemon drop are used to increase stats instead of the typical EV system. This wouldn't be entirely awful if not for having to feed Pokemon candy one at a time. It can take 30 minutes to clean out the candy jar after <laughs> a couple hours of play. This aspect of the game also just doesn't feel very good, which is weird because it does in Go. The circles over Pokemon don't freeze when you toss a ball, so you need to overpredict, aim, and pray that the Pokemon doesn't spastically move away the second you throw, made worse by a fairly extensive delay. It takes about half a second to ready a ball, and there's a decent delay before the ball is thrown, which makes catching feel constantly terrible. This is, of course, with the standard controls, and it's moderately better in handheld mode, where you just press A to throw a ball in a consistent, predictable arc after aiming, but the motion controls, which you're forced to use docked, are pretty dreadful. The delay feels even worse, aiming feels completely inconsistent, a throw will sometimes just rocket off into space, and you can't aim the camera. You need to throw curveballs, which do not register well at all, the catching is... passable handheld, but playing this game the way it's intended is a dreadful exercise in tedium. The game also has co-op exclusively for the catching segment. I imagine the sentiment was to drag a little toddler through with you, but it adds so little that I have no real input here. Catching does at least have some interesting aspects, primarily outside of itself mechanically, namely in things like catch streaks. The more you catch the same type of Pokémon, the better the rewards. Pokémon higher in the chain tend to be statistically better or higher level and have increased shiny rates, plus you begin to get an experience multiplier speeding up grinding, and it even plays into a rare spawn system, a kind of novel method for getting Pokemon that were formerly gifts, trades, or otherwise limited. Pokemon like Starters, Porygon, Snorlax, and others are available at extremely low percentages, but at catch chains above 10 will begin to appear very frequently. These tend to be higher level, harder to catch, but especially Chansey, which appears on most routes and caves when nothing else fits, give a ton of experience. 
The system is neat as it gives a few Pokemon substantially earlier better availability than they otherwise had, such as being able to find more of the legendary birds in the postgame for shiny hunting or better stats, as well as making Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan not one-offs as breeding isn't in this game, to avoid having to reconcile the absence of Gen 2 babies. In fact, there are very few Pokemon beyond the original 151. Two mythical Pokemon introduced in Pokemon Go, of all things. The 20 Alolan forms introduced in Sun and Moon, which are all variations of pre-existing Kanto Pokemon, and the Megas introduced in XY, Omega Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire, although obviously only for the Generation 1 Pokemon that got them. This does give a little bit of much-needed variety. Hell, it's better than Fire Red and Leaf Green had, as the Alolan forms can be obtained and used throughout the game, and also gives access to some Dark and Steel types, which are otherwise pretty limited to say the least. I was already reaching to make teams in those games, so it's appreciable, but it does make the lineup feel a little bit weak to have cut the various evolutions related to the Gen 1 Pokemon. The lack of abilities also really harms the Alolans and Megas. Unlike the Gen 1 Pokemon, these were created and balanced with abilities in mind, and some of them really rely on them to work, and are just outright not very good without them. Some proper Gen 1 Pokemon are definitely hurt to an extent, but none to the level of, say, Alolan Golem, whose Galvanize ability turns its normal moves into electric moves so it can properly use its new electric stab, and is instead forced to crutch on the decent but not spectacular Thunder Punch. And speaking of types, I almost neglected Fairy, a type introduced in the previous generation, uh, in X and Y, created to kneecap Dragon, something it arguably did a little too well as it was a fairly dominant type in its own regard for a long time. It still kinda is. Offensively, Fairy is strong against Dark Dragon fighting, honestly a fairly irrelevant bunch for Kanto as there's five dragons counting alones and Megas, four Darks, although there's not a single character that uses one, and Psychics already have a strong presence for fighting. And the moves are resisted by Fire, Poison, and Steel, which to be fair are also decently irrelevant types in Kanto. Defensively, Fairy resists Bug, Dark, and Fighting while being immune to Dragon. While this is a good lineup, as before, it's mostly irrelevant for Kanto. The type is only weak to Poison and Steel, two incredibly defensive types, which are part of why Fairy is so strong. Fairy is really only notable in this game for having a few Pokémon that switch types. In total, 22 Pokémon were made Fairy types in Gen 6, although only 5 of those are Generation 1 Pokémon. Clefairy and Clefable were made Pure Fairy, which has made them substantially stronger between their already massive coverage and the addition of incredible stab off Fairy moves, plus they were already incredibly defensive, and Fairy's a very good type defensively. Jigglypuff and Wigglytuff are now dual type normal fairy. Fairy covers normal's weakness without damaging fairy's good stuff, although the pair are still discount Clefable, and Mr. Mime is Psychic Fairy, a surprisingly neutral and bulky type that allows Mr. Mime some extra survivability and gives a bit of extra power off of fairy moves. Steel was also given a minor nerf in Generation 6, removing its dark and ghost resists. Not an overwhelming change, but a minor tweak to their power nonetheless. Really, the last new thing to touch on is Megas, although they don't appear until extremely late in the game. Certain Pokémon have gained a new form in Mega Evolution, and after their stone is collected, this form can be used on one Pokémon per battle, lasting until the end of that battle. Mega Evolving grants Pokémon 100 extra points to their base stat total, usually a rough increase of 20%, give or take, depending on their original stats, as well as potentially changing their type and ability... Uh, right. Um, well, some of them change their type anyway. In proper mainline games, Mega Stones are held items, which makes them a bit unbalanced here, as there's no downside. But fuck it, nobody ever played Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee competitively, and nobody cares if you steamroll the post game with Megas. Uh, I miss Megas. They're a fun mechanic that allowed some interesting team building, mind games, and saved some terrible Pokemon like Beedrill, giving them some time to shine. But the issues with terrible balance, especially with certain abilities and terrible distribution, two fucking Charizards, provided a good enough argument for Game Freak to chicken out on them, which is a shame especially as this is their final appearance, and it's limited as a send-off only for the Generation 1 Megas. As far as the battle mechanics are concerned, I think that's about it. It's all good. Battles are few and far between, even with the fairly high amount of trainers in the game, but the physical special split, additional Pokemon and Megas give it a good mix of new stuff and a decent amount of depth despite cuts to abilities and items. If leaning a bit aggressive, as status moves aren't nearly as powerful when not being used for catching. Sleep is great in battle, but fairly unreliable in accuracy when you're being slammed by smart and aggressive AI. Traversing the overworld also has a decent amount of changes, although it'll be a bit briefer here. First off, you can dress yourself in your starter Pikachu or Eevee and pet them as well. It's cute, but that's about all there is to it. I think 
cutting it boosts its friendship to some degree. More notably, HMs are removed, field moves are learned from various NPCs, and while I'm a bit sad to see them go, as they force you to consider moveset choices around them and help bond you to your Pokémon as they help you navigate the world, it does open up your potential for team building through not having to consider those choices. TMs are also unlimited use, this allows a lot more experimentation with movesets, which is very appreciated with how easy it is to train Pokémon up through catch chains in this game, although it does reduce the strategy in their usage too. Give and take, I guess. Although this is definitely preferable to Generation 1 for me. The experience share has been a bit of a hot topic in the series uh, lately, 10 years lately, but in this game you kind of need it. Battling is a limited resource, and cutting yourself off from any experience is going to force you to grind catches, while balls themselves are a limited resource. You can get 10 balls for free in some dungeons if you have none, but it'd make the game substantially more tedious. My biggest issue with the experience share is that it just takes away the incentive to play suboptimally. In former generations, you sometimes had to send out Pokémon against things they weren't great against for the purpose of getting them experience for later. Here you can just chuck whatever in the party, play completely optimally in every major fight, like leading grass against Brock, and stuff is gonna work out fine. This also de-incentivizes neutral types like normal, as hitting everything broadly neutral isn't optimal in most situations. It makes it too easy to be lazy, it makes it harder to justify things that aren't playing into optimal play. Friendship also has some added perks, and I'm not a fan. As you use a Pokémon, its friendship inevitably rises as always, but this now at high levels grants increased critical hit chance, a small chance of focus ban effect, which lets you survive a hit that would be lethal, boosted evasion, and the ability to occasionally cure status. Half this shit is as good as abilities, but your whole team has this, and in other games, this can stack with crazy abilities. The game feels pretty badly balanced, and it's always a little... Uh, it feels bad to win by lucky crits, it feels bad to clutch through on a lucky focus band effect, and to never get punished by status. It's a little obnoxious and belittling. There's really no getting around how necessary it is to progress through this game though. Like, last the encounters have been somewhat sanded down. There are very few gift Pokémon besides your starter. The game corner no longer has Pokémon for sale, the only in-game trades are for the Alolan forms, which are all infinitely repeatable for the respective Cantonian forms, and even fishing is gone, moving all the Pokémon obtained through it to being surf encounters. All encounters in this game are overworld encounters instead of random. They wander about the overworld, so finding rare Pokémon is alleviated a bit in difficulty, and lures can further increase both spawn rate and the odds for lower rarity Pokémon to show up including shinies, which makes the game a very smooth experience for completionists, but it does feel a little unrewarding that every single Pokémon is found in the same way. One of the few things that is unchanged is overworld encounters, with the same Pokémon as before having proper battles. Snorlax, Voltorb, Electrode, and Legendaries, although here they just need to be defeated to open them up to catching as opposed to returning to traditional wild encounters. Like everything this game offers, it's a series of trade-offs. I never cared much for fishing, but it does make the game feel a little samey not to have them. And while the increased variety on routes through low-rate Pokémon is nice, as is having overworld encounter, there's nothing that feels very special without trades or gifts save the few fixed encounters. I think the game is fun enough, but it's undeniably a very simplistic experience in most regards that leaves it feeling a bit underwhelming at times, and it's largely a little bland in general on gameplay aspects. While the gameplay is quite a mixed bag, the presentation is anything but. Kanto is rendered incredibly here, rich in detail and love, it's hard not to gawk. One of the brilliant things of having a game so limited, no controllable camera, almost all at a fixed angle, and with narrow straight routes is that you can afford to polish every single little thing that's within the camera's scope, and they went above and beyond in this. Character designs are a bit awkward with their oversized heads, but the colors are vibrant and colorful, something you can't say for the 3DS games which looked very washed out in most places, and Pokémon are accurately scaled to the environment when available as encounters or when serving as following Pokémon, all of whom have their own very detailed animations, and in a lovely bit of care, some of whom interact uniquely when used as a follower. Certain large Pokémon can be ridden, Onyx, Rapidash, Persian, and are generally faster for navigating the world, replacing the bike if you happen to use one, and in the post-game, certain Pokémon can even be ridden in the air for unique encounters and to literally fly over gates and dungeons like Victory Road to traverse the map faster. The love and care isn't just in the characters either, environments have so many little things. Cinnabar has docks. Two of them. Cinnabar, La Cinnabar Lab has a cloning chamber in its basement and taking Mewtwo there causes them to have a unique reaction. Towns are decorated with lovely flowers and fountains, gyms now have sadium seatings on the sides which fill up more and more throughout the game. Brock is the first gym, so excitement isn't as high as everyone fights him eventually. 
but the deeper you go, the more lively the crowd. Plus, gyms have seen really detailed and creative overhauls for their visuals. Misty's gym is now an Olympic pool lined with diving boards and featuring a gorgeous watertight mural made just for it. Surges is covered in propaganda posters and on and on. The detail is fantastic, and while a few of Fire Red and Leaf Green's quirks remain, I think the game is undeniably gorgeous, lively, and really helps Kano come into its own visually, keeping its realistic mundanity while still giving pretty much every area some sort of unique flair and identity. The music is also given a lot of time to shine. The new renditions are very high quality, detailed, and well instrumented, and far outdo the limitations of the Game Boy and the crust of the Advance, giving these classic tracks a real great modernization. They will still digitally produce, definitely feel like they're way more grand and melancholy and nostalgic and adventurous, and every other feeling they hit more than they've ever felt before. Despite anything else, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are games that very obviously cared and tried to flesh out Kanto, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the best it's ever looked, and it's not even close. Version exclusives in this game are pretty straightforward and thankfully not nearly as awkward as Fire Red and Leaf Green. First off, the starters, Partner Pikachu and Partner Eevee. The standard forms of these are unlimited in both games, but these special ones are separated and untradeable and untransferable, sealed away forever on each respective game. From here, largely, the games follow a blend of yellow and red and blues lists. Sandshrew and Pikachu, Ekans and Eevee, although Sandshrew has a new form, it's actually matched with a different Alolan form, I guess. Oddish's line in Pikachu and Bellsprout's line in Eevee are now rebalanced out as Blossom doesn't exist in this game. Like in Red and Blue, Pikachu gets Mankey's line, while Eevee gets Meowth, although Pikachu can get a single Persian as a gift, and this kind of loops back into Yellow's little detail of avoiding having the Team Rocket Pokemon in the game. And like Sandshrew, Meowth's line has Alolan forms I'll touch on shortly. Pikachu gets Growlithe, although like Persian, a single Arcanine is available in Eevee. I guess they're kind of soft counterparts to each other, huh? And is again paired with Vulpix. More interesting, however, is the Alolan forms. Both Sandshrew and Vulpix have new Alolan forms. Sandshrew's is Ice Steel, as is Sand Slash's, while Vulpix's is Pure Ice and gains Fairy when evolving into Ninetales. Beyond the half ice typing, both also evolve by the newly introduced Ice Stone, and have this weird version exclusive thing going on as offshoots to the version exclusivity that they already had in their Cantonian forms. For the first time, Grimer's Lie and Coughing's Lie are version exclusives for Pikachu and Eevee respectively. Coughing is another Rocketmon relegated to Eevee, but both are fairly similar Pokémon. Two stage poison types that evolve at a fairly high level, Pure Poison, found in the Cinnabar Mansion as soft version exclusives in the prior games, both based on a form of pollution. The similarities are pretty obvious. Grimer and Muck's alone forms are also part of an exclusive pair. Grimer and Muck are Poison Dark, and match up to Meowth and Persian's Pure Dark alone forms, although largely just based on process of elimination and matching a type, plus uh, the same guy trades them to you in the different games. Lastly, we got Scyther and Pikachu and Pinsir and Eevee. And so close to the end, we get an imbalance, as Pinsir finally got some love with Omega. I guess fair enough for the years of Scizor-based imbalance, but it's still kinda weird to end up with a single version exclusive Mega with no pair. Honestly, this feels like a pretty bound split. Mega Pinsir and Victory Bell, plus the very unique for this game Alola Ninetales, are all big wins for that game, and it doesn't hurt that Partner Eevee is a decent chunk better than Partner Pikachu, although Pikachu has cool stuff of its own. Both Sand Slashes are really solid, Scyther owns of course, and Grimer is a better catch than Coughing, I think. Either way, it's hard to feel like you're choosing wrong with either game. Uh, you probably just want to pick on whichever starter you have, especially because online trading makes it a lot easier to get the things you're missing. I don't understand the intro to this game. It begins with the main character getting sucked into their Switch like an isekai. I don't get why it's like this. Like, actually, what does this plot add? For some reason, Red and Blue are characters in this game, and the two already beat Team Rocket and the League and did everything you do in this game, but it all got undone so the story plays out like normal? It just seems like clutter on a story that already worked fine, especially when it's virtually consequenceless and never comes up past the intro. Blue occasionally shows up and is just like, yeah, hi, what's up? Great job, kid, but largely nothing has changed at all. It's really confusing and inconsequential. As before, and as always, Pallet Town. The partner Pokémon are pretty interesting. Depending on the game, you either get Pikachu or Eevee, but these carry distinct stats, moves, and quirks from standard Pikachu and Eevee. Starting with Pikachu, the solid 110 extra base stats, pretty evenly spread around, it doesn't get it up to the level of Raichu, but it's not that far off either. Not only that, but it gets at least a little more to do than standard Pikachu, given the unique tutor moves these Pokémon have. 
giving Pikachu access to a water and flying move in reference to the famous surfing and flying Pikachu. It's not great coverage for what is still a fairly weak electric type, but it's at least a bit more than it normally has, and having a strong physical move in Zippy Zap helps as it still leans slightly physical. Um, I, I don't know why the tutor names are all so bad. Like, the water one is called Splishy Splash, they're all just... yeah. Eevee is given the same treatment. While the extra 110 doesn't push it nearly as close to its evolutions, it has a new tutorial move for each and every evolution. Not just the Gen 1 ones, but even Espeon, Umbreon, and so on, which gives Eevee an extensive list of coverage for basically every special type, making an extremely versatile asset to fill basically any holes a team could have. I think they strike a nice balance. They're not overpowered, but not nearly as terrible as Pikachu was in Yellow, and the versatility especially on Eevee allows it to maintain some sort of team niche, which isn't as easy for most normals thanks to experience share as I said earlier. To facilitate how the game is played, the player begins the game with a fairly generous 50 Pokeballs. Their price in shops is reduced to 100, while Great are 300 and Ultra are 500. All other balls are excluded from this game, sans Premier Ball, which is a gift you get by buying 10 Pokeballs at a time, and has the same stats as a regular Pokeball. The game's economy works decently enough, the low cost of balls and lures allows you to feel pretty consistently stocked, and trainers usually give a few Pokeballs when defeated, or even better balls later on in the game. There's a few spots where money gets tight in the early game due to a lack of trainers, especially Mount Moon and Rock Tunnel, but it's balanced well enough to never feel bad until the end game, where you can really only efficiently generate money by repeatedly clearing the Elite Four, which is extremely tedious. Route 1 rips the bandit off pretty immediately, nothing will be the same. The game is rebalanced, remixed, and stuff is shuffled everywhere. Alongside the stuff that's usually there, the Pidgeys and Rattatas, Pikachu has Oddish and Eevee has Bellsprout, right there, 30% spawn rate on the first route. The game is immediately tossing you a bone to minimize the difficulty of the first two gyms, a somewhat necessary concession given Pikachu and Eevee are both exceedingly bad against the ground and rock types of Brock's gym. But with Mankey being separated back to a version exclusive, I guess this was the next easiest choice. Although you also could have just left Mankey where he was. Meanwhile, somewhat ironically, for the first time since Red and Blue, Mankey has been tossed out of 22 and the Nidorans have returned. Speaking of 22, I guess I should talk about Trace a little bit. As you are Red's analog, Trace is Blue's. But he's a Melvin who rolls over for you constantly and isn't any fun, and is kind of just one of those modern Game Freak buddy rivals pasted over a rival who is fine as he was. Uh, why is this an Isekai again? Trace uses the start of the other game, and Pikachu uses Eevee, and Eevee uses Pikachu. Unlike yours, these aren't the decently broken partner versions, but he will eventually evolve them. In order to keep the teams consistent between games, he always chooses Jolteon, which is fair, but the variable teams is a pretty interesting gimmick for Yellow. It's also kinda neat that this ends with your partner Pokémon falling behind statistically. He also has a Pidgey, so that's cool. I'll talk more about Trace as his team develops, but I think Jolteon being largely better than Raichu, it basically balances out. Pikachu resists Jolteon attacks, while Eevee doesn't resist Raichus. But Eevee is generally the more usable of the pair. Viridian Forest, for as nice as it looks with the light coming down through the trees, also shows one of this game's most immediate flaws. The series' first dungeon is made completely toothless without random encounters. In Viridian, you ran the risk of poison off Weedles, paralysis from Pikachu, and just generally being worn down as you worked your way through the grass. Here, it's pretty much all benefit. Every encounter is extremely free experience, especially as the chain grows. To compensate someone and provide money for Pokeballs, there are more trainers, but given how much experience you rack up, if you're actually catching things, you'll very likely end up incidentally overleveled at pretty much every point in this game, including this one. It makes dungeons feel very flaccid. Even in a situation where your Pokemon faints, you can just waltz out while continuing your catch chain. You will never be put in a bad situation by the length of a dungeon. It's not all bad, beyond the usual Caterpie, Weedle, Rare Pikachu, there's a few interesting things in here. Fully evolved Butterfree and Pikachu and Beedrill and Eevee for one at a 1% rate. Their evolution levels are so low you'd never need to hunt one down, but it's kind of interesting. And the forest also has the first rare spawn, Bulbasaur. Without knowing how the rare spawns work, you likely won't see one, which makes it an extra cool reward for engaging with catch chains, which the game very loudly declares to you constantly. Although it does moderately undermine Oddish or Bellsprout. Not just in that it's a bit stronger than those two, but also, well, anything that can eventually Mega is long term more useful. While Pewter is still surrounded by trees, I think it does a more solid job of integrating that. The stone walkways give it a bit of a rustic feel, the museum is overhauled to look more elaborate. I think it's the first time I noticed how pretty the game was, if only because of the simplicity of the early towns and routes. 
Layout-wise, Peter's Gym is unchanged, although it's a great place to talk about my favorite detail added to these games as a whole. Spectator stands and gyms. As you progress, they slowly fill up more and more as hype builds for your champion run. It's a wonderful detail that helps hype up every battle you have. As for the gym, the layout is traditional, although you are required to have caught a grass or water type Pokemon to enter. Given there are no available waters, this means Bellsprout, Oddish, or Bulbasaur, although you're not actually forced to use it, so you can just box it after you show it. Brock's team is basically the same as always, although access to grass makes him rather trivial. Notably, all leaders have rematches in this game, unlike Fire Red and Leaf Green. The rematches don't particularly impress. The mid-50s leveling after the Elite Four and limited pool of solely Gen 1 Pokemon makes them fairly weak. Brock's Onyx and Golem aren't particularly bolstered by having all three fossils, although I do like that the game explicitly states he mined them from Mount Moon. And of course he still has his Onyx, which by the post-game is an absolute shitmon and like Golem is slow and four times weak to grass and water. Kabutops and Amistar are four times weak to grass although Kabutops is admittedly a hard hitter, and Aerodactyl hits hard but really struggles to take hits. Moving on past that, on Route 3, is that... is that Charmander? From Kanto? Charmander isn't excessively useful in this stretch of the game, but they do well to rush through all the starters. 3 also has the first Master Trainer, moderately tougher trainers that appear here and there and give better rewards when defeated. Usually TMs, but also candy, rare items, and so on. They tend to be 5-ish levels above the standard trainers, if not a little more, and depending how studious you are with catching, can put up a decent fight. Mount Moon, like Viridian Forest, is highly kneecapped by the lack of wild battles. The risk is so low that it's decently viable to cruise through the entire dungeon without healing at all. The trainers are fairly weak here, and if you've been fishing for rare spawns, they'll be even weaker. Hell, Mount Moon even has the first appearance of Chansey, which while not particularly usable in this game as uh, something to be on your team, has far and away the highest experience yield in the game, and is still one of the highest in the series, which makes it a fantastic grinding target. Onyx is also thrown into Mount Moon, not that it's very good, but I guess it's even less good when it's locked in a rock tunnel, as is Clefable at an extremely low spawn rate. It's nice to see the stone evolutions return to the wild after Fire Red and Leaf Green. It's not new to this game, just something that began to reappear in the series as it went on, and the restrictions that Gen 2 and 3 had laxed. Mount Moon also features the first appearance of Jesse and James, who are fought throughout the game like in Yellow. Having them be a double battle every time is nice, but they always only use Ekans and Coughing and later their evolutions, and are absolutely devastated by Earthquake later on. They are complete jokes. Which is fitting for their characters, but not very satisfying. Route 4 has Psyduck earlier than usual. Not like in a place that it's useful, but it's kind of neat to know. Uh, on 24, Trace has an Oddish. Vileplume is, I mean, unfortunately just not very good. It's very defensive and slow. Although in the end game, it has a little bit of cool stuff going on, although especially here, it doesn't round out very well. Nugget Bridge, while functionally unchanged, has a fantastic and lavish redesign with the fancy white and gold, and is one of those many, many little things that makes this game feel really polished. 24 and 25 have some cool Pokemon too, uh, Squirtle is a rare spawn, and like Yellow Venonat. While the Bill subplot plays out identically, I love the cutscene here. It's simple but extremely well animated and makes the partner Pokemon look really cute and endearing, which is their job. Cerulean is really pretty too. I love how much flair has been fit into such a simple city. The blue scaled roofs and the fountain, for the first time, Kanto feels fully realized with regards to how you were meant to imagine it in the simple, colorless world of red and blue. Cerulean has the first of the Alolan forms too. Rattata can be traded for its Alolan form, infinitely repeatedly, in order to give the game a touch of new blood. Alolan Rattata is dark normal type, same for its evolution Alolan Raticate, which like its standard form, evolves at level 20. While the addition of Dark Stab is nice, Pursuit, Bite, Crunch are all moves you'd probably use on a standard Raticate already, and hell, a Ghost and Psychic community isn't bad at all, even if the 4 times fighting weakness is, but the stats are quite a bit more underwhelming. All Alolan forms maintain their base stat total but can shift their stats about, although Alolan Raticate drains its speed and attack in favor of being more defensive, but its relatively low base stats mean that it still lacks the bulk to support a more methodical playstyle and ends up feeling a little bit awkward. Cerulean Gym is very gorgeous. The diving boards, and especially the mural covered in water types, make Cerulean feel so much more opulent than the smaller towns of the early game. The layout has changed a bit to essentially match pewters with side paths to swerve around the trainers on the gym, 
Misty receives the first new team she's ever really had, replacing her Staryu with a Psyduck, which, while not a substantial change, is a slight mix-up. While her Starmie now uses Scald, which is an incredibly powerful water move with a high burn chance, which has a very solid chance of crippling physical stuff that would otherwise counter it like Beedrill and Alolan Raticate, which is a very solid way to keep her threatening despite how easy and in fact almost guaranteed it is to wind up overleveled. Well, during her rematch, she picks up some of Kano's strongest on top, Gyarados stacked with physical moves, Dugong, and Vaporeon. Depending on the version, routes 5 and 6 include Vulpix and Growlithe, giving access to these two a bit earlier than usual, which is nice because this game has very limited access to fire types. Although as with the early grass types, Charmander throws a bit of a hook in the viability of these non-mega having fires. Meanwhile, East of Vermilion on 11 is the first former trade exclusive, as outside of Alolan trades, they've all been removed. Mr. Mime, whose fairy typing is a nice bonus to its already fairly strong stats, as most former single stages had. The SSN is relatively unchanged. I mean, as most things have, it's been given a detailed makeover, my favorite being the paintings hanging on the walls, but largely even Trace is unchanged, Sans is Pidgey having evolved. When you leave, you also meet Mina, a trial captain from Pokemon Sun and Moon, which is essentially that game's equivalent of a gym leader. She got off the SSN and got left behind, and you can fight her daily for bottle caps. Rare items that can max out a level 100 Pokemon's IVs in a particular stat, essentially making it permanently better. I was confused why she's here, but then it clicked. Kanto otherwise has no major fairy trainers. Her fairy choices are limited, to say the least. Using Jigglypuff and Mr. Mime, and after the Elite Four, she evolves Jigglypuff and gains Alolan Ninetales. It's a small but decent set of Pokemon, although her three Mon team is pretty scant. You also need to continually remember to return to Vermilion daily to fight her and farm bottle caps if you want a chance in the postgame. Likely 25 or so times to get everything up to its proper stats, which is... a lot. Cut is no longer an HM, instead being replaced by a special technique. As with the removal of all HMs, this significantly benefits the ability to build diverse teams, but I do feel draws from the decision making. You don't need to make hard choices with your teams and lose the bond of your Pokemon navigating you through the world, since Pikachu or Eevee, of course, since they're the ones who actually learn these techniques. In Vermilion, Geodude can be exchanged for its Alolan form, which evolves in the same way as its Cantonian form, 25, then by trade. Alolan, Geodude, Graveler, and Golem are extremely damaged by lack of abilities. Rock Electric is already a type with some severe holes, to say the least. Water, fighting, uh, double ground weakness, and some pretty wimpy resists and flying normal and poison. Never mind that Alolan Golem has the same stats as its standard form. Huge physical attack and defense, low everywhere else. The pool of physical electric moves in this game is very shallow, and basically amounts to Thunder Punch, which is not terrible, but is a little middling for this game. In the proper mainline games, its ability Galvanize makes all normal moves electric type and boosts their power, giving it some devastating moves in Explosion, Double Edge, and so on, which just isn't the case here. It still has solid rock moves for Stab, but its electric type is more of a burden in this game than anything else. Vermilion's gym is decked out with what appears to be wartime posters, which helps flesh out that often neglected aspect of Surge. Not only that, but the puzzle is actually fixed, featuring switches in fixed locations whose locations are hinted at by the minor trainers in the gym. Surge's team drops Pikachu for Magnemite, although this is even further smashed by the decent availability of ground types at this point in the game. And the most unfortunate part of Surge is that his rematch team draws from Kano's very shallow, monoelectric pool. Electabuzz, Jolteon, Raichu, Electrode, with only Magneton to break it up. Design-wise, the gym really does most of the heavy lifting for making this segment memorable because Surge's team is not doing that on its own. Diglett's Cave can have Zubat. That should be illegal. Flash has been made far less painful, it doesn't need a slot, but it's also been made more useful as the game's few dark areas are pretty unnavigable for once. Route 9 is probably the one route with the least new stuff, although 10 notably features Krabby. Thanks to the removal of fishing, a few water options escape being solely locked to the mid-game, including this little guy, which boosts the variety otherwise available from Squirtle, even if Squirtle is inarguably more usable. There's also a new fight here against some rockets that's used to introduce Lorelei. I don't really know why. I guess they wanted to characterize her some, and it kind of reflects the fire red leaf green Sevy stuff with her but none of the other Elite Four get this treatment. Lance never shows up anywhere, he's just some guy. Bruno has like two text boxes total. Uh, as for Rock Tunnel, I mean, it goes from obnoxious and boring to 
boring. The decent amount of trainers can set you back a bit, but it's certainly not the struggle it was in prior games. The cave relocates another Safari Mon, Kangaskhan, who is for this point in the game actually really powerful, although its spawn rate is very low. Cubone is also here slightly earlier than in Pokemon Tower, which has led to some, I think, largely unfounded speculation on its relation to Kangaskhan. They do have a similar design in ways, but so do like Nidoking and Kangaskhan. It was just Sugimori's style. Lavender is very pretty. Well, I'd still prefer the dirt, but I appreciate that it's not a paved road with various shades of purple over plain old grass, and the stairs up to the tower are very classy. Lavender has the trade for Diglett's Alolan form, which is ground and steel, and evolves like its base form at 26 into Alolan Dugtrio. The typing is hypothetically really solid, but Dugtrio is still glass cannon. The slight speed drop from 120 to 110 is a bit unfortunate, but not lethal. I mean, 110 is still great. But putting it towards defense was just stupid. Its attack and speed are still both really solid, and the additional stab is nice, I guess, if you can find a seal move to use. Seal is a bit more offensively relevant for fairies, but this game has very few of those. Although standard Dugtrio's insane speed probably makes it the stronger Pokemon in basically any scenario. Beyond that, like, I also just hate Alolan Dugtrio's design. I think it's really ugly. <laughs> Before leaving Lavender, the player needs to go fight Trace in Pokemon Tower, as well as go to the second floor or else the Team Rocket HQ is inaccessible. I really only mention this because I got thrown off hard by this, because I usually just clear the tower in one clean run, and it feels a little restrictive and obtuse, although I understand that it's used to set up the Cubone and Ghost Marowak stuff. It's also notable that in this fight, Trace's starters evolve to its final stage and his Oddish is now Gloom. His team grows much slower than Blue's did, which makes him feel a lot less like a proper rival. Route 8 has Arcanine or Ninetales on it. That's kinda cool, I guess. Those are some stone evolutions. And Route 7 has Porygon as a rare spawn, which is a nice spot to put it, given that the Europeans killed the game corner. Thank you, Germany. I mean, first things first, the game corner is gutted due to silly European laws. I Never liked the slots, but it's kind of lame that the game corner is just an arcade to look around now. It looks nice and all in the descriptions of various Pokemon mini-games from the previous games, like the surfing one from Yellow is cool, but I think it would have been nice if any of them were playable, especially since some of them came from what this game is a remake of. Celadon is nice, I think it already had some of the strongest theming in the game, so it doesn't have nearly the jump that places like Cerulean did. Things are mostly the same in the same spots. There's no free Eevee anymore, and the tea is given to you by Brock in a cutscene to further idiot-proof entry to Saffron. Plus, after Team Rocket HQ, you get Fly from some guy who just shows up in front of the game corner. Version-exclusive Alolan forms are available here. Sandshrine Pikachu is Ice Steel and evolves by Ice Stone into Sand Slash. It's a very odd typing. It only ends up with three weaknesses, Ground Fighting and Fire, although the last two are both four times weaknesses, although it maintains many of Steel's resistances. It's a decently hardy typing unless it's being torn apart by the few things that break it, and draining Special Attack to boost both offenses actually gives Alolan Sand Slash a decent amount of survivability to mitigate its low speed and let it hit with its huge attack stat. The worst part about it is that it's kind of limited on moves, as physical ice is a fairly small pool, especially in this game, and steel just doesn't have a huge offensive pool at all. Although Sand Slash can certainly land strong ice punches and metal claws, while also maintaining most of its normal form's ground coverage options too, such as Dig and Earthquake. It was probably the most fun Pokemon I used in either game. On the other hand, Eevee gains access to Alolan Vulpix, pure ice which evolves via Ice Stone and gains Fairy when it becomes Ninetales. Ice Fairy is a real rough type defensively. Not the worst weaknesses in the world, but only resisting Bug Ice and Dark, plus the Dragon Immunity means it gets hit neutrally by virtually every strong offensive type besides Ice. That said, both types are great special attacking types, and while still a little low on that front, definitely threaten some types hard. The extra speed is nice, as it would never use its physical attack, but draining special defense for special attack would have made it much more usable. It's much stronger for having good offensive types than it is for having supremely good stats or anything like that. Team Rocket Hideout is largely unchanged in layouts, beyond like this little gimmick bit where you control Pikachu or Eevee to grab a key. But there is one bizarre new inclusion, Archer? Archer was kinda introduced in Gold, Silver, and Crystal as a nameless executive, and would reappear in that same role in Fire Run Leaf Green, and then would be more properly flushed out in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. In some alternate universe where Let's Go continued, perhaps this would be light set up for Let's Go Johto or something. But as it stands, he's just kinda around in two places. Archer only uses Weezing and Golbat in this first fight. Neither of these are very good, although Flamethrower Weezing is a funny meme. 
And I assume to balance out having Archer just before him, Giovanni only uses two Pokemon himself, Persian and Rhyhorn. Rhyhorn especially has a great moveset with Drill Run, Mega Horn, but even in the older games you almost always be over leveled here, let alone in this game where you're constantly on catch chains and whatever. Erica's gym finally has a proper design, kind of, which while basically just a maze with some cut trees as I guess technically more interesting than the nothing from before. But it's very straightforward and linear for a maze, especially compared to the really creative layout Heart Gold and Soul Silver had. Erica somehow was made even worse than before. Tangle has Sleep Powder at least, but Victory Bell and Vile Bloom each have Mega Drain and a coverage move. She has no options on strategy on a type that isn't particularly good on its own, although on rematch she has substantially better movesets for these three, alongside the decently powerful Executor and, uh, Parasects, but uh, they can't all be winners. Pokemon Tower is, you know, nice. It looks great and the appearance of the ghosts is really cool. I think it's a great translation of those old 2D sprites. But again, dungeons lack impact. The dungeon already was pretty weak given it's almost all given it's almost all ghastly with occasional haunters. I do like that Marowak isn't fought in this version, instead it's reunited with its child Cubone and passes on peacefully, which, while a little less satisfying gameplay-wise, is a much, much nicer outcome, especially because when you talk to Mr. Fuji at the top, he's like, oh, you helped it pass on peacefully. No, I beat the shit out of it. Trace ends up adopting the Cubone and uses it as a team member for the rest of the game, which I think is way more satisfying than beating the hell out of a dead mother. <laughs> After getting the Fluke, the Snorlax on 12 and 16 can be woken up. Unlike every other Pokemon in the game, the fixed encounters are actually battled, as I said before, but hate to say, they're just not that interesting. Unlike battles in the mainline games, there's no life balancing, statusing. You just kill them and then catch them. Just go all out and finish it as fast as you can. Although it's not the worst mix-up that this game has, given how everything else is basically just this completely flat catching minigame. Route 17 is easily the most changed place in Kanto. The lack of a bike would make a bike path kind of weird. So it's instead been renamed to Pokemon Road. It even switches up what trainers are around, dropping the bikers for a variety of trainers who stand next to their ace Pokemon, including a bunch of oddballs the trainers rarely use, like the Eevee evolutions. The makeover is really nice too, being converted into this calm walking path with paved roads, flower gardens, benches, and lamps. It's a really unique and relaxed area that the game doesn't have anything else like. Ponyta and Rapidash hanging out on this route really puts them by far at their most available for the Kanto games, which is nice given how late they came otherwise, and Eevee is available as well, fittingly on the opposite side of Celadon from Porygon, and as it's infinitely repeatable, there's no Generation 1 issue with not having the ability to gain multiple Eevees. Route 18 has literally never had anything on it. Okay, wow, Fuchsia has a lot going on. The Japanese-styled houses are a fantastic touch, and the Pokemon in the zoo just hanging out is adorable. The Safari Zone is removed because, like, the whole game is a Safari Zone and it's just not necessary anymore, but I'll get to its replacement in a second. In the zoo, speaking to a man next to a surfboard gives access to Surf, which opens up access to a good few Pokemon, basically every Water, Shelter, Goldeen, but also to Dratini and Dragonair out on Route 10 near the Power Plant, which I'll come back to. Going slightly south of Fuchsia has Jesse and James find the gold teeth and give them the player out of disgust, letting you get strength as well. A trade is also available for Alolan Marowak. Cubone lacks an Alolan form, and therefore Alolan Marowak has no evolution requirement in this game. Although as Marowak is unavailable in the wild, the Cubone must first be evolved for the trade. Alolan Marowak completely shifts its design, being a fire ghost type. It's a fun design that serves both the callback to the ghost Marowak that was in this very game, as well as Hawaiian fire dancers and their connection to Hawaiian spiritualism, as Lola is based on Hawaii. Olin Marowak shares its stat with the standard forms, good defense, slow, and okay, but slightly low attack. Marowak is left at a pretty harsh disadvantage here, as fire and ghost are a type combination with a ton of common holes, and both are very specially focused types. It's too frail for flare blitz, so it has to use moves like Flame Wheel, but it does get a signature move to go alongside Marowak's other two, Bone Meringue and Bone Rush, Shadow Bone. A decently powerful physical ghost move with a chance to lower defense, although it's not really enough to patch up the pretty harsh issues alone Marowak has. Also, I'll just talk Koga's Gym real quick, because the Safari's replacement is a lot. The gym has a new invisible maze layout and a new gimmick. The maze is fully invisible, but periodically fog rolls through and shows the walls. It's a neat little gimmick that also makes the cool Japanese ninja house theme a little more atmospheric. Koga is 
better than he's ever been. Toxic can protect strats on Weezing Muck and Golbat, but also without crutching on Minimize for actually interesting stall stuff. Moonblast, a fairy move on Muck, and Venomoth is Venomoth, but man, Koga does pretty well for himself. And on rematch, he also gains Tentacruel as well as just a bunch of goofy coverage like Thunderbolt, Weezing, U-Turn, Golbat. Uh, someone on the team clearly loved Koga and wanted him to be good for the first time ever. Anyway, the Safari is dead, replaced with Go Park, which lets you transfer Pokemon from the mobile game Pokemon Go. Including the first Pokemon to be semi-Go exclusive, and for the first time in mainline games in this very game, the mythical Pokemon Meltan and its evolution Melmetal. Both pure steel. In Go, Meltan can be caught by using the Mystery Box, which can be used once every three days after transferring a Pokemon from Go to Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee or Home, causing it to appear for one hour. And their evolution is rather unique, as they're incapable of evolving in the mainline games, so you cannot evolve a Meltan you trade into this game. Instead requiring 400 candies in Go. Notably, this fucks up Meltan as it's incapable of gaining the boost from Eevee Lights, although the lack of held items in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee makes that pretty moot. Being a mythical, the official term for event legendaries, Melmetal is pretty good, having the typical 600 base stat total of mythicals. It's very slow and has middling special, but its HP and physical stats are gigantic. Virtually any physical attack bounces off of it like it's nothing, and even its non-stab physical moves tear things apart, and it even gets a fairly solid signature move in Double Iron Bash, which hits twice for 60 base power. Each hit has a 30% chance to flinch as well, and add on to that a massive attack stat and stab. And while not the most offensive typing, you get a really incredible physical attack right here. Oh right, for some reason, transferred Pokemon seem to appear at all sorts of random levels. I think it's up to your Go Trainer level, so maximum of 50, but they seem to tend to appear at absurdly low levels, which makes training them up a bit of a pain in the ass, even with the exceedingly easy grinding in this game. Also, one odd restriction on transferring is that you can't transfer Mew from Go. When this game came out, there was a special controller release for it called the Pokeball Plus, which is a Pokeball-shaped Joy-Con that only works with this game. It's very clunky, uh, and if you bought that, you got Mew. One Mew per controller, and so they don't let you transfer in Mew, so good luck finding an unused Pokeball Plus now. I guess I better talk about Go for a little bit. This game was based around it, after all. Pokemon Go was originally released in 2016 for mobile phones and was developed by Niantic, and like, it was a bit of a big deal. Go is an AR game having a map that follows the player's real world location on which Pokemon appear and can be caught by throwing balls with your finger. The throwing and catching is actually extremely smooth and satisfying, and the precision you're granted is great. It feels like the exact opposite of Let's Go's motion controls, and it's fairly fun to do. Go has some perks too, you can transfer stuff into eligible games to bypass version exclusives, legendaries are often available in raids, infinitely repeatable if you have the resources to fight them, which also helps fill version gaps. And shinies are ridiculously common in Go, sometimes too common. I have a ton, many of which I transferred into Let's Go, and it's enjoyable for what it is, but the game sure is scummy. Coins for purchasing consumable items or upgrades can be earned for free via leaving Pokemon in gyms, but that has a hard cap of 50 coins a day after 8 hours of occupation. It's very slow and grindy, and 100 coins is a dollar. The game loves to squeeze you. 100 coins for balls if you need them, which you rarely do, but also raid passes, incubators so you can hatch more than one egg at a time, eggs can require up to 12 kilometers of walking to hatch by the way, and on and on. Honestly, there isn't a lot to the game. You basically walk around and and catch things and then release them and find shinies. <laughs> it's largely a very simplistic game, fun enough as an excuse to go for a walk, and the catching mechanics destroy Let's Go Pikachu's and Eevees, but the grinding and scumminess definitely wear on you. I wouldn't exactly recommend it unless you want an excuse to wander about, but it's not exactly dreadful. Also, when you see my clusterfuck team image later, just know Go is easy access to a lot of fucking shinies, so. Okay, I'm gonna kinda glance over the boring trainer routes. 15 and 14 have both Tauros and Pinsir or Scyther at extremely low rates. The low amount of grass on these routes actually makes finding these shits a pain in the ass, even with incense, because only like 4 or 5 Pokemon will appear at a time. As in Yellow, 13 and 12 have Farfetch'd, this game is a remake of Yellow, and often features things like this, like the Venom ad on Route 25, but it also often borrows from bits and pieces of Fire Red Leaf Green, Red and Blue, and even Japanese Blue, so it's fun to see the specific things like 
kind of. The Power Plants layout hasn't changed, although even more so than Fire Red and Leaf Green, it looks fantastic, with the grimy dirty floors, barrels, and junk scattered all over, and Zapdos' room having the big generators. When interacting with Zapdos, there's also a neat little cutscene to start it off. The dungeon's gimmick is preserved here surprisingly, the electrodes are fixed encounters and are therefore properly battleable, although you can also just catch them wandering about the plant which makes it a little less special. Grimer are coughing and their evolutions are here too, which is honestly more fitting than the Pokemon Mansion, and adds a bit of variety to the encounters here. Also, the removal of battles means this dungeon isn't a paralysis fest like it was in Fire Red and Leaf Green, which makes it completely toothless, but man this dungeon was pain in that game. Looping back to Saffron, all the flowers on the buildings are cute. The paved road really helps tie it to Tokyo, plenty of details in the light posts and benches. I hate the color, but that's just me not liking yellow very much. Saffron features the trade for Alolan Raichu, which like Marowak can't be evolved into in this game, and similarly, as Raichu is in the wild, requires you to evolve a Pikachu first. Raichu gains Psychic type in this form, which is a cute nod to the episode of the anime from way back to the surfing Pikachu. It also takes minor hits to its physical stats for its special stats, which combined with Raichu's already great speed, makes it a fantastic special attacker with two powerful, if slightly offensively niche types. It even gains access to some boosting like Calm Mind, which can make it really intimidating when a lot is set up, especially given how little counter psychic in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. The fighting dojo is more or less the same, but the master uses Polyrath for whatever reason. Upon defeat, you still either get Hitmonlee or Hitmonchan, although both are later available as rare spawns in Victory Road. Also noticeable, Hitmonchan is decently usable in this game thanks to the physical special split, letting it just lay in with the elemental punches, as well as just an increased variety of fighting moves in general. While Sylph's layout is unchanged, it has some really strange quirks. For one, it begins with a battle against Blue, not Trace, but the real Blue, who I guess already fought Team Rocket at Sylph in the past at some point. I don't get why it's like this. Blue uses Executor and Charizard, a neat detail that ties into this ancient key art, showing what many people consider the canon starter pairings, although this fight replaces the one you would have with Trace, but Trace is given something to do on floor 5, where you'd normally get the key, in a double battle with him against Archer and a random Grunt. Trace is virtually useless, but it's fairly easy to just Earthquake or Surf Plow through your opponents while he fiddles about, and it's a nice gesture towards double battles, which I believe are otherwise only seen with Jesse and James. This also gets you the key, because Archer gives it to you, for some reason. Archer is seen again as he reached Giovanni and Trace stalls him, but he can also be rematched in the postgame in the Rocket Hideout under the game corner with a Magmar and Electrode added to his team, also directly mentioning that he's ignoring Giovanni shutting down Team Rocket to rebuild Team Rocket elsewhere, which serves to set up the let's go Johto we never got. At least I assume this is the case as it contradicts roughly the same thing happening in Fire Red and Leaf Green's Sevi Islands. As for Giovanni, his Persian gains play rough. Fairy coverage is always cool to see, but only gains Neoqueen otherwise. Porygon and Lapras are still available as gifts here, although both are available in the wild elsewhere. Porygon on 7, and Lapras is a rare spawn encounter on the sea routes 20 and 21. Saffron's gym has a hell of an upgrade. The Saffron Knight skyline is a really odd, cool, and somewhat unfitting theme for the gym that certainly stomps on empty rooms with teleporters, if nothing else. The teleporter maze gimmick is still intact, although that the buildings are arranged in a zigzag formation makes it moderately more disorienting. Sabrina's team has a nice variety boost too, with a variety of secondary types. Mr. Mime's fairy type makes it a bit harder to crack, although it mostly just exists to set screens for the other. Slowbro and Jinx have stabs for their secondary types, and Alakazam is just... good. She always tended to be one of the better leaders in Kanto, but I think this team largely solidifies that role for her. Lots of variety despite the monotyping, which is what kills most leaders. In the post game, she also blows up her coverage, goes fairy, ice, fire, electric, and she also gains hypno, which uses some sleep strategies. Okay, I'm hard skimming the sea routes, 19, 20, 21, you fight a million water types from the trainers, Lapras is an e-rare spawn, the series is never solved how to make sea routes interesting. As I've had to say a dozen times, Seafoam is made basically toothless in this game. One Master Trainer and Articuno are literally the only things that can put you at any risk of taking damage. Like most areas, it looks great, the fog and cool colors are nice. Strength requires a button press to move it each time. I guess it makes sense to prevent mistakes, but it makes doing strength puzzles very moderately more tedious. It's admittedly a nitpick and hardly relevant here, but it's a little more apparent in Victory Road where the strength blocks are all moved to start closer to their endpoints because they knew it was tedious to match A every time. Cinnabar has two docks. They must have stolen Fire and Leaf Green's dock. 
Cinnabar is so simple that there's little to say. The lab has a solar panel, that's kind of neat. Fossils can be revived here, notably all fossils can be reacquired periodically as hidden items in Cerulean Cave that reappear like once every day or so. Meaning, despite the lack of breeding, there's no worry about getting locked out of one or the other as Red and Blue had. Cinnabar also has traits for two more Alolans, the other two version exclusives. Alolan, Meowth, and Persian and Eevee are pure dark, evolution at 28. Would you believe me if I said they were supposed to be special attackers? Persian is still very fast, but look at this moveset. It doesn't even get dark pulse by level up, it's really bad. Especially without its ability that helps to take hits. Pikachu gets Alolan Grimer and Muck, which have Dark in addition to their poison typing, but maintain identical stats. Good attack, good special defense, and health, but slow. The typing is fantastic, only leaving Muck with a weakness to ground, although it's pretty flatly neutral to every offensive type. The additional stab is great, although it still has a fairly slim attacking pool, but the stronger defensive typing makes it pretty definitive improvement. Mansion is cool, it looks good, the cloning tank in the basement is a great touch, and that Mew and Mewtwo have unique reactions to it if following you is great. There's almost nothing to say otherwise, Toothless, few trainers, same puzzle. It's nice, but I'm on round 3 of Kanta, so I'm kinda just... over it. <laughs> Blaine's Gym is another great one, instead of the kinda lame walk of trivia, it's framed as a live broadcast game show complete with studio audience. Getting questions right moves you on, getting them wrong gets you a battle. The presentation is really fun and it characterizes Blaine in a way that's unique from any other incarnation of him. Blaine also benefits from HMs being gone, as the player isn't necessarily going to have a powerful water move like Surf as they would have in the previous Kanto games. Hell, he was the hardest leader for me in Pikachu because I had so many fire-weak Pokemon and no solid counter. Just a hole in my team I'd overlooked, I guess. His biggest weakness is that fire doesn't have a lot of secondary type variety in Kanto. Magmar, Rapidash, Ninetales, and Arcanine are all pure fire, which means he's pretty exploitable, and the only interesting cover on his team is Arcanine's Crunch and Outrage, which are both fairly neutral attacking types. On rematch, he adds Flareon, not a very good Pokemon, but he does add a lot of solid stuff moveset-wise, like Megahorn on Rapidash, Solar Beam on Ninetales. It's sad that the rematches are made into such a cakewalk because of kind of middling levels, only about 10 above where Blaine already was. You'll fairly easily lap these rematches and levels, even going at them immediately after the Elite Four. Route 21 has fully evolved Victory Bell and Vileplume, that's kind of cool. Viridian's Gym is locked when you arrive, you need to visit Oak before you can enter, where Blue, funny joke with the name thing by the way, gives you a handful of Mega Stones, exclusively for the Kano starters, so if you wanted to make a shitmon like Beedrill fun, oops, sorry, post game. Even more so than Alolan forms, Megas tend to suffer without their abilities. Mega Venusaur, for example, has the ability Thick Fat, which removes its fire and ice weaknesses, allowing it to be an extremely bulky wall. It's by no means bad without this, and the additional 100 base stat total pushes up to an insane 625. Venusaur gains 20 in its attacking stats and special defense, and 40 in its defense. It largely plays identically to Venusaur, but better. It's a big grass and poison special hitter with even more survivability. Charizard, rather infamously, has two Megas, only one of two Pokemon with this distinction because of course Charizard would. Mega Charizard X is Fire Dragon, a type that substantially shifts its type resistances. Ground and Rock are pretty rough weaknesses, but the Rock weakness is only a 2 times from standard Charizard's 4 times, but there's also value in being able to bait out attacks. Electric becomes resisted if you switch the turn it was fired off at you. Its resistances are mostly pretty weak types, unfortunately. X is really interesting, boosting both its attack and special attacks through stream highs. Its ability would make it lean much more physical if it had it, but given the lack of that, it becomes a really powerful mix attacker that can lean either way, using a combination of whatever powerful physical and special moves you can toss on it, especially because it's now a dragon type, which gives it access to Outrage, Dragon Breath, and a few others like that. On the other hand, Y retains Charizard's original typing, but massively inflates its special attack, effectively maintaining the original's playstyle, but being substantially stronger while doing so. As for Blastoise, it gets substantial boost to its attacks and defenses, primarily special attack. Blastoise was pretty defensive, so perking up its offenses lets it do the standard water stuff even better. If you happen to be using any of these three, you can immediately use them for Giovanni, which is cool if a bit limiting. Like, the game wants me to use the starters, which I've used a few dozen times again for Megas instead of just letting me have some freedom. As for the last gym, while not as nuts as Heart Gold and Soul Silver's version, the final spinner puzzle is decent, if short. You kinda need to ignore the color coding as it gives away the puzzle a little bit, but it's appreciably condensed. And Giovanni's lair with the basket of catching berries, the monitors, is really cool for him. Makes him feel like a James Bond villain. Like Blaine, he's potentially rescued by Surf not being mandatory, although I don't know if his team is really good enough. 
Thug Trio, Needle King, Needle Queen, and Rhydon are all heavy hitters with some powerful moves between them, Earthquake, Mega Horn, Poison Jab, but they all have very exploitable weaknesses, and unlike other leaders, there's no rematch. After this defeat, Giovanni disbands Team Rocket and dedicates himself to studying Pokemon, and unlike Archer, Jesse, and James, and virtually every other major trainer in the game, he's gone. It's a very respectful treatment for his character, but it does mean he ends on a relatively weak final team. In a fun bit of tie in the later events, Blue takes over Viridian's gym and is fought in the post game instead of rematching Giovanni. Using a pretty unique team that plays with some of his previous team stuff. Using Charizard, Executor, and Gyarados, all of which comprise the core of his team if the player starts with Venusaur in Gen 1 and 3, as well as Alakazam, which is on all of his Gen 1 and 3 teams. Well, the Aerodactyl he uses was a Pokemon he first used in Black 2 and White 2's Pokemon World Tournament, and has appeared a few times since. His final Pokemon is Tauros, which hasn't been on a team of his before, but is a really solid lead. Pretty much everything on his team is fantastic, lots of hard hitters, and while not as wacky as his Gen 4 Trick Room team, has a lot of cool coverage, tries to set up light screen and reflect, lots of variety, and as a final trick, he'll Mega Evolve into Charizard Y, which is a significant threat in its own right. On 22, Trace has fought again. His team hasn't changed much from his last appearance, Pidgeot, Vileplume, Marowak, Raichu, Jolteon. He's fought again in 20 minutes anyway, so who cares? Route 23's music is gorgeous, and the suspense building is great as always. Needle King, Needle Queen, and Executor are all really funny, very low rate spawns that appear here. Stones are very available in this game, so farming them is a waste of time, but it's interesting that they show up at all regardless. Victory Road is really cool, the torches and lighting give it this ominous and foreboding look, and they even extend it to giving Moltres this cool little shrine surrounded by torches. The volume and variety of trainers on Victory Road can still keep it moderately challenging even if much of the difficulty has been lost by the design decision of this game. Puzzles have been condensed with blocks being nearer to their ending positions, thankfully because some of the pushes were pretty awful. Ain't too much surprising here, Rhydon is convenient since Rhyhorn is a bit of a grind, and Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan are here to alleviate their otherwise one-off status. The Indigo Plateau has the final Alolan form trade, Executor, for its Alolan form, which is Grass Dragon, a type almost as unfortunate as Executor's normal typing. Four times weak to ice, weak to flying, fairy, poison, and so on. Although it has okay resist in water, electric, and ground. Executor slightly drops speed in favor of attack. Not that bad, considering the difference between 55 and 45 is negligible when most good stuff has at least 90 speed, and it has a signature physical dragon move in Dragon Hammer with really solid base power. It's slow and vulnerable, but it can serve well as either a physical or special attacker and is decently bulky. The Elite Four is very similar to the Fire Red and Leaf Green incarnations. They utilize some new moves, but team comp doesn't change much. Lorelei's Dugong has a bunch of priority in Ice Shard and Aqua Jet, Slowbro has Flamethrower, which is funny if useless, and you know Jinx, Lapras, and Cloyster do the things they always do. On rematch, each member of the Elite Four gains an Alolan form Pokemon, which is cool as they're the only ones to do so outside of Mina, I believe. Lorelei gains Sand Slash, who serves to break up her team with some really hard hitting physical attacks, as well as stopping electric sweeps, while her whole team gets the kind of coverage you'd expect from rematch teams. Thunder Lapras and Poison Jab Cloyster are both very funny choices. Bruno is an interesting one. Off the bat, he drops one of the Onyx that he always had for Poliwrath, Kind of funny both major fighting trainers have one now, which gives them something outside of the pure fighting stuff and onyx. Hitmonchan has all three elemental punches, which he finally uses well and can shut down a lot of stuff broadly, and Hitmonlee and Machamp just use the good stuff, Rock Slide, Earthquake, Superpower. He's still the weakest, but not nearly as shameful as he once was. On rematch he has Alolan Golem. Man just can't figure out what a fighting type is. To his credit it has a fighting move. I suppose. Onyx still doesn't, but Stealth Rock is hilarious, and Poison Jab Hitmonlee is... something. Agatha is most disappointing. Not only does she have even less ghosts than before, keeping the two Gengar but dropping Haunter for Weezing, and maintaining Golbat and Arbok, basically making her a poison type trainer even more so than she already was, but she's dropped all the tricky shit. Curse, Hypnosis, Confusion. For as annoying as it could be, it made her unique and standout opponent. Where here she largely uses sensible offensive sets. Shadow Ball and Sludge Bomb Gengar, Air Slash, Golbat, Wheezing with Thunderbolt is novel if useless. On rematch, she gains a Lolan Marowak, at least it's actually a ghost, even if it largely doesn't add good counterplay to her team. It's not awful though, and she tosses Sucker Punch on the Gengars, which is a little more tricky, I guess. Lance has fewer dragons than ever before. Seedra, Aerodactyl, Charizard, Gyarados, none of these are dragons. Although Seedra evolves into this one, not in this game. 
Siege was also fun as he had a King Druid, Fire Red, and Leaf Green, and the team is admirably diverse outside of a glaring electric weakness. But only having a single Dragonite as a dragon is a little silly. The rematch gives him some dragons proper. Alolan Executor is really weird and interesting Pokemon for him to use. His Charizard mech is into X, making it half dragon, and in general, some coverage is tossed about. It's nice in the game that only has three dragons, they found a way to buff out Lance's dragon count at least a little bit in the end game. As for Trace, I appreciate they hold out on the surprise for the last bit of his team until here. In the prior generations, you fight Blue's whole team on Route 22, so when you fight him again later, not much has changed. On top of his starter, Pidgeot, which he now Mega Evolves, which gives it a very decent stat boost, Marowak, and Vileplume, he also gains Slowbro and Rapidash. Pidgeot, Rapidash, and Raichu, or Jolteon, are really fast and can push decent damage, while the other three are slow but bulky and hit hard on the crackback. There isn't a ton going on strategically, Heatwave, Pidgeot, Reflect, and Light Screen, and a great range of types to cover a broad range of defenses and offenses, but also using a team mostly of mediocre Pokemon that do exactly what you'd expect them to. And given he has a full team, all the rematch can do is toss some moves around. Some pretty interesting ones like U-Turn, Pidgeot, and Drill Run on Rapidash, but not an impressive boost. Trace definitely doesn't have the team Blue did, and while it's nice that they built something different for him, it leaves him without much impact that he doesn't have the heavy hitters Blue had, like Gyarados, the Kano starters, Alakazam, and he ultimately just feels in fear in every way. And everything wraps up with US Champion, but this game actually has a lot going on after this too. After clearing the Elite Four, Mega Stones come up for sale. They're very expensive, and really the best way to generate money in the end game is just to go through the Elite Four over and over, so getting them is a bit tedious. Let's knock these out kind of quickly. Mega Beedrill turns Beedrill from low tier garbage into a fairly solid Pokemon. Its worthless special attack status drain to dump everything into attack and speed. It's still super frail, but it's gone from a frail weak thing you can use in the early game before good stuff starts to evolve to an extremely nasty revenge killer that can shut down and even sweep off the back of Felstinger. It's a shame it doesn't have its ability, which boosts stab and makes it even deadlier. Mega Pidgeot is very strange, pivoting Pidgeot from a mediocre all rounder to a blazing fast normal flying special attacker. <laughs> it does get some moves, Hurricane is huge, Heat Wave for some spice, Hyper Beam as a finisher. It's just that Pidgeot still struggles with a relatively shallow move pool to make use of its titanic special stat. Mega Alakazam is easy, it went from fast but frail, hard hitting special attacker to being even faster and hard hitting -er. It does exactly what Alakazam does, but even better. Mega Slowbro, similarly, is pretty well unchanged. It gets a giant boost to defense and a solid boost to special attack. It's basically impossible to break physically and hits back even harder in retaliation, but it's not a substantially different Pokemon from what it was. Similarly, Gengar gets a fat special attack and speed boost, plus a little bit in both defenses. Its ability makes it nuts in other games, but here it's better Gengar. Its speed is great, and its already amazing special goes even further. Poor Kangaskhan, from the most broken Mega due to its absurd ability, to good, not great. Losing the double attack that its ability grants means it's better Kangaskhan. Its boosts are pretty evenly spread between its stats, with attack gaining the most, and a pinch to speed, it's a solid all-rounder for physical attacking, maybe even great, but it's basically doing Kanga but stronger. Mega Pinsir is unique if a bit sad without its ability, gaining Flying type. Not a great type off the bat, probably the worst in the game, but getting a respectable bump to all its stats, especially attack and speed. The issue is that like Alolan Golem, its ability Aerialate makes normal moves flying, which actually gives its secondary type some use. In Let's Go Pikachu, for flying moves, it has literally nothing. The stat boost is nice, but not worth the horrendous typing, especially when it doesn't get the additional stab. Gyarados' design is so inspired, trading out one form of the Kinobori kites for another. Very cute. It swaps its secondary flying type for Dark, which is certainly more creative than just making a dragon. And hell, Gyarados has never really used its flying type anyway, but it's arguably a bit worse defensively. Sure, no more 4 times electric weakness, but that and Rock were its only weaknesses, and now it has fighting, bug, grass, electric, and fairy to worry about. Although it has a suite of good resistances too. While it gains some decent attack on top of its already huge base stat, it largely gains bulk, letting it take a few more hits. It's an interesting trade-off, and with Dragon Dance, it not gaining speed is a minor issue. But the defense boosts feel a bit underwhelming for something that just wants to sweep. It's better than Gyarados in some ways, but not substantially better enough that if you have a better Mega option, you're gonna want to use this. Lastly, there's Aerodactyl. Nice to see the best fossil get some love. Holy shit. Awful design though. Awful. Just terrible. Attack boost, speed boost, a little bit in defense. It's better Aerodactyl. This isn't our last Mega, but the other two will come in a little bit. 
I love Megas mechanically, but they're not incorporated very much into this game, and therefore it's a better conversation for a game more focused on it. You can at best use a starter for Giovanni in the Elite Four, while everything else is pretty well sealed away to the post game. And useful here, it's just too late to impact the game very much. Soaring is also unlocked here. It's a minor expansion of the ride mechanic, allowing you to ride on the back of large flying types like Aerodactyl, Pidgeot, and so on, which gives you some shocking freedom, letting you fly right over route gates and even directly over caves like Victory Road and Rock Tunnel, which really just lets you zoom around the map. Flying also has some unique encounters, fully evolved Charizard and Dragonite, but perhaps most interestingly Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres. So all his rare spawns, presumably for the purposes of chaining for better stats and shinies. It's a little wacky lore-wise that dozens of these things are just flying about, but I can understand the desire to make them accessible and give players a reward in the post game. As opposed to the usual battle towers and facilities of the other games, Let's Go Pikachu introduces a rather novel post-game battling challenge in Master Trainers spread throughout Kanto. One for all 153 Pokemon in this game will use their Pokemon in a 1 vs 1 mirror match against the player's zone, with the exception of Ditto, as its mirror is impossible because they only know Transform, Articuno, Zapdos, Moltres, Mewtwo, Mew, Meltan, and Melmetal, presumably to preserve the being special, with these exceptions just needing to reach a certain stat threshold for the reward. The problem with these becomes apparent extremely fast. Most Pokemon have really, really lame mirrors that turn into stat dick swinging competitions, and all of these fuckers are well IV and EV trained, so prepare to grind caps from Mina, prepare to grind candies, and prepare to spend 25 minutes feeding your Pokemon said can. Take Bulbasaur. The Master Trainer uses a level 65. You need to grind yours up to at least that. Give it 5 to 6 caps you can only get once a day and drop a bunch of candy on it, and for what? Bulbasaur's best option for dealing with itself is spamming Sludge Bomb and praying affection mechanics let you cheese it a little early without needing to overlevel and grind. There's a few of these that are a little more thoughtful, and since these guys never use Alolans or Megas, you can get a bit of edge or variety off of those. But largely, it's a lot of grinding. There's an interesting reward for this. After defeating six, preferably your in-game team, to minimize grinding, you get to fight Red. The, the real Red. You're just an Isekai guy. Red is... Surprisingly, extremely difficult. Like the Master Trainers, he's fully EV and IV trained, and while you can cheese past the 1 versus 1, you're gonna have an extremely hard time with Red if you aren't willing to grind. Like with Blue, he has the Venusaur from this old key art and Megazit, while also taking stuff from other games. His Pikachu, Lapras, and Snorlax from Gold and Silver, primarily, and alongside those, Machamp and Arcanine. I mean, they're powerful and cool Pokémon, but I don't really get why they're here. In general, all these Pokémon are really solid options, uh, save Pikachu, who's just there because, you know, obligatory. And between the perfect stats, high levels of 85 across the board, and really good moves like a Toxic Rest and Protect Stall Snorlax, Will-O-Wisp and Roar Arcanine, Amnesia Venusaur, and so on, and generally a broad set of types and defenses on his team. He's maybe the hardest individual trainer that the series has ever had, surprisingly so given how easy this game otherwise is. Pleasantly, if you're happy to make things for competitive, but probably restrictively so for most people, which is perfectly fine in my opinion. He's a very good super boss. And that just leaves Cerulean Cave, I suppose. The cool colors and crystals are a good visual differentiation from the other dungeons. No wild battles is kind of lame, you can get more fossils here. That's always a good thing. Cerulean is mostly the same as its red and green and therefore fire red and leaf greens layout. Although for whatever reason the top floor is just one giant empty room, I assume just so that you have somewhere convenient to grind since this is the best grinding spot in the game. It's really easy to navigate beyond the lack of wild battles too. My apologies to all six Lickitung fans in the audience, he's the least available non-legendary in this game, being stuck here. Mewtwo's fight is fine. At this point though, you're just not going to struggle against a single level 70 Pokemon, even one as fantastic as Mewtwo. And given the game lacks legendaries, he's easily the only choice for the Master Ball. It's nice that even using the Master Ball, you need to fight him, but like in Red and Blue, it feels a little anticlimactic. After getting Mewtwo, Trace tells you about a girl who went into a cave looking for Mewtwo. That girl is... green? Green is... kinda a new character. Red and Blue have no analog for this character, and in Fire Red and Leaf Green you have Leaf as a player character. However, unlike, say, Ruby and Sapphire, she isn't a character or your rival if not selected, she just doesn't exist. The Pokémon special manga actually does have Green as a major character, and oops, let me zoom out at this key art. Here she is in early concepts, with a Squirtle. Her Mega Blastoise matches up with the ancient concept art, and probably incidentally she uses a Clefable, which the Manga Green has, as well as Gengar, Victory Bell, Kangaskhan, and Ninetales. She's not nearly the monster Red is, especially because her stats aren't all perfect, 
but it's a collection of solid, mostly bulky Pokemon with a good range of types. Clefable's fairy typing is pretty tough to deal with in this game, especially if it sets up dual screens, however levels are decently low. The team is fun, nice variety in type range, some very funny moves like fake out Mega Blastoise, but she's a rather straightforward opponent without many flourishes, and coming out of nowhere at the ass end of the game makes her more than a little forgettable. She feels like she should have shown up somewhere else earlier in the game to at least set her up. After a defeat, she gives the player the final two Mega Stones from Mewtwo, because what else would have two Megas besides Charizard? Both have an absolutely absurd 780 base stat total, substantially higher than Arceus, and probably the highest any usable Pokémon will ever go, tied with something else, it's not important. <laughs> Mega Mewtwo X gains the Fighting type. It's a largely neutral type combination, with mostly uncommon weaknesses and mediocre resists. And as its typing implies, it shifts completely into physical attack, and like its special attack is still pretty absurd, it doesn't go down, but they definitely want you pivoting the other way. Mewtwo's substantial coverage gives it at least a bit of physical stuff, most notably the newly stabbed Brick Break, as well as stuff like Poison Jab, Rock Slide, Earthquake, which gives it more than enough to do even if it lacks a good physical psychic move. Although 154 special attack is still absolutely absurd, so it hardly needs it and can play a kind of mixed role. It's a very strange and interesting twist on Mewtwo. That is to say, at the very least, it's pretty obscene even if it feels a little awkward. Also, both of these forms, I think, are just even more extending the Frieza reference that Mewtwo already kind of was. On the other hand, Mega Mewtwo Y is Super Mewtwo. Insane special, decent boost to attack, relatively frail. It can just spam whatever special move and annihilate anything that's in this game. And the speed bump doesn't hurt either. And that's everything all done. I think it's a dungeon I love, but I miss wild battles and I'm so sick of Kano. So let's talk teams and the anime and the manga and wrap up. Okay, my teams are pretty straightforward again. My options are more and more limited for Kanto, so excuse my bizarre shitmons. Partner Pikachu, I mean, what is there to say? I'd shuffle about the tutor moves a little bit as they became convenient, but it's Pikachu. Beedrill was a shiny I transferred in from Go, mostly motivated by wanting to use Mega Beedrill. Beedrill and its Mega are admittedly one-trick ponies, cross scissor and poison jab, but it's solidly one-shot, most things, with a weakness to bug or poison. No Metal is another Go transfer, surely for the novelty of a Pokemon design, well, kinda for this game alone. It was frankly unkillable physically, but its solid attack stat made Double Iron Bash and Thunder Punch really solid attack options in the niche scenarios it came up in, especially as fairy counters are few and far between. Alone Eradicate was my solid psychic answer, a very common type in this game. Alolan Sand Slash is also a bit of a one-trick pony, Ice Punch Dig. The ground coverage ironically made it my strongest fire counter despite the horrific 4 times weakness. And lastly Arcanine is just a solid hard hitter that actually has a fairly fleshed out moveset in this game, including Play Rough, although it did occur to me at some point that my team was basically entirely physical, which caused some issues for me in the long term. I also got a shiny Krabby in the post game and like 80 things from Go, sorry for the clusterfuck image. In Let's Go Eevee, Partner Eevee is substantially more usable than Pikachu. Its variety of tutor moves allowed me to fill any holes in my team with its signature moves. Depending on my needs, primarily Eevee its grass move, which also sets seeds for some extra healing. Almost immediately upon entering Mount Moon, I stumbled into a shiny Zubat and dragged it through the game with me. Golbat ain't great, but between Air Slash and Crunch and decent speed, it could land a handful of decent hits. I also transferred in some other wacky shinies. Alolan Golem is a heavy hitter on the physical side, despite its speed. All it sucks it doesn't get a better electric move than Thunder Punch. As well as Gengar, my dedicated Mega, and a crazy special attacker that can toss up virtually any move you could hope for. Plus, the shiny Mega looks fucking sick. Mr. Mime is a rare chance he's a fairy in this game, but also provided some solid utility and reflected light screen that made putting in some of the riskier stuff easier. Alolan well, Golem mostly. And lastly Rapidash, which is basically Arcanine again, a very physical fire type with a bit of neat coverage and drill run. Also I transferred in a bunch of Go Shinies, sorry for the closer fuck image. Again. Somehow, Let's Go Pikachu got an anime, kinda. Pokemon Evolutions is a series of short one-offs featuring on different bits of Pokemon, all of which premiered on YouTube last year and run about 10 minutes long. The last of which, the Discovery Magnifying Glass Emoji, is quite the title, follows Green Chase and Chase looking for Mewtwo and Cerulean. There's not much going on in this short special, but it's decently animated if a bit rough around the edges, and decently gets the art style of the games down, although Pikachu looks really strange with its bulbous head. The fight between Mewtwo and Blastoise is decently well animated, but that's really the extent of what there is to get out of this, and its existence is a bit baffling given how far out it was released from the game. There's also kind of a manga, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee Adventure Start comic by Kamon Kawamoto, who's done some of the Pokemon movie adaptations for the manga, which was released in Korokoro alongside this game's release. This shit sucks. 
It's a manga of two kids playing Let's Go Pikachu to advertise and spew beginner tips uh, to someone. Even though the game already explains everything here, uh, the art is fine, I guess. I don't know. This It's not a real story, but for the sake of completeness, I, I read it, I talked about it, so... Uh, okay, let's wrap this up. What is Let's Go and Pikachu EV, really? I don't know. It's gorgeous, absolutely. Sounds amazing, and it has fun ideas. Master Trainers are a super unique gimmick and would return in a way with Legends Arceus. And Mega's Encanto is novel and fun even if they're tossed at the end. Plus the lack of HMs and alone forms are a huge boon for variety in Kanto, even more than Fire Red and Leaf Green had somehow. And like, that's cool and all, but the game is largely kind of boring. The gameplay loop of tossing out balls gets old pretty quick, barely works if you're using motion controls, and makes the game, until the huge grind at the end, pretty much a cakewalk. You're constantly overleveled if you actually catch stuff, and especially if you chain. A lot of encounters are super low spawn rate, so there's actually a few things that are just completely awful to find. The Pokeball economy is almost too well balanced, where until you need to work on the post-game grind, you never feel the pressure of money, and largest of all, you just never feel the pressure to think. Dungeons have no barrier to just waltzing through them thanks to the lack of wild battles, and the few battles that remain, the major ones at least, are completely monotype save trace, blue, green, and red. You never have a reason to play suboptimally because HMs are gone, and the experience share keeps stuff you're not currently using reasonably leveled. The game is pretty vapid, beautiful, and a really good version of Kanto in that the world is fun to explore, fun to play in the moment, but just kinda bland. I don't know what the fix is besides reverting the mindless catching for more proper gameplay. I don't hate the game, I actually quite enjoy it in a simple mindless way, but it barely feels like a game most of the time. If this was a normal Pokemon game, with wild battles and all, I think it'd be the definitive Kanto. Hell, it still might be in some ways. And it's undeniably a great entry for the really young, or people who just want to monkey around with shinies and catching and living decks where this game makes collecting things really easy, but it's just kind of lacking in any thoughtful aspect. The team building, the decision making, it's a hypothetically good game that just doesn't have much meat on its bones. I think it's mostly worth a playthrough for the novelty of seeing Kanto in the best lights, but it's just not all that great. I don't know. I'm mixed on it, I think, more than anything. Anyway, I need a break from Pokemon very badly. Sometime we'll get back to... Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Omega Ruby, Elves, why are there so many? Also, I've been playing through Coliseum with Grant, so that'll be coming, and other stuff, I'm sure. I, I never escape, but... Oh, thank you for watching, thank you for waiting. I know that these videos have taken a long time to come out, because my life has been fucked. Um, my voice is running out. And, um, if I have anything else, I'll put it in some text here. Uh, have a good night. Subscribe, maybe. Um, yeah, bye.